Good morning from Chicago. Uh, this is Lyric Hughes-Hale. I'm Editor-in-Chief of EconView and your moderator today for our session entitled Solutions for an Impact-Led Recovery. Um, if we are in fact in recovery from COVID-19 and it could be too soon to declare universal victory, has this crisis fortuitously created a path to sustainable growth? Can profits and social and environmental goals really be complementary or is there integ integration now simply necessary to compete for investment? Which industries, countries, and regions will lead economic regeneration? What types of new regulations can businesses expect? Or will co corporations voluntarily create impact-led growth strategies? What kind of new partnerships will we be seeing aimed at creating public goods benefiting all stakeholders? Finally, if the recovery stalls, will ESG suffer? Our panelists will try to answer these and other questions with a lightning round of three to four minutes each, leaving time we hope for 20 minutes or so of panel discussions and questions. So I believe you can ask me a question in the comments area and uh, I'll be watching for those as we um, go through our panel. So welcome everybody. Thank you, thanks for having us. Thank you. It's a great honor to be here. Wonderful to be here with you. Thank you. Wonderful. So I, um, we um, had planned to start with Payal, but she is not here. So Ivan, I, is it okay if we start with you then? Yeah, sure. In order. Okay. So um, I will briefly introduce you and you please um, correct my pronunciation um, sure. if necessary too. Ananda Satiu, uh, Ivan Anto is director of A-Wing Group in Indonesia. However, he is now, I believe, in Japan. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and it all starts with energy. I think everything in the world runs on energy. Can you tell us about your efforts in this area? Right, uh, so yes, uh, it's, uh, my, my name is Ivan from A-Wing Group, uh, and we have been uh, 12 years, almost 12 years in uh, renewable energy uh, as our main business. Although we all we also have some ventures related to waste management, uh, uh, dental healthcare, and also food business among others, uh, so perhaps I'd like to answer the questions uh, that you gave to us uh, from the energy perspective. Uh, so I, I believe that uh, uh, because of uh, the COVID nineteen, uh, there there is uh, a new path uh, to sustainable growth, and this is what uh, I. Uh, that, that we also experience, uh, especially in Indonesia, uh, where the country uh, where we are trying to focus uh, our main, uh, mainly of our business activities, in which uh, before the discussion about ESG, SDG, uh, about uh, uh, circular economy, uh, renewable energy, was not, be, was not that of a mainstream before actually COVID-19 happens. It's only like within the small groups of people and uh, uh, only a uh, few people uh, or small circle uh, uh, that actually discussing about this issue intensively. But thanks to uh, COVID, actually, this is a kind of a blessing in disguise. Well, first of all, we enjoyed uh, a more blue air in Indonesia. We can uh, we can see the mountains that usually uh, covered by smog, uh, and uh, we becoming becoming more aware about the issue of climate change. And for I don't know in other countries, but Indonesia, we do love to have webinars almost every day. And it's quite uh, uh, it's quite uh, uh, interesting, and it's quite um, uh, thankful to see that uh, more and more conversation related to the climate change actually is coming into the picture. So, um, so, uh, so, so there I see that uh, it really opens up a sustainable growth uh, pathway uh, and make it this issue to becoming a more mainstream in Indonesia. And does profits and social environmental goals? Uh, 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 is it able to com compete and how is it being integrated? I think uh, uh, now, uh, yeah, because of uh, the discussion about climate change and the environment and renew renewable energy is becoming more mainstream, then I think there are more and more uh, uh, ways on how we can able to integrate uh, profit with uh, social and environmental benefits. But the problem is we are not used to uh, provide uh, or to, to have such a policy where we gave uh, uh, significant uh, incentives uh, towards uh, uh, environmental uh, efforts uh, and uh, not not mentioning to uh, reduce uh, carbon emission uh, etc so 
now the dialogue is there it's happening and we just need to make sure that we able to do the right thing with the right support and uh, yeah, industries like us uh, in for example in renewable energy uh, can actually thriving uh, especially preparing uh, for the new economy uh, post uh, covid so um, and so yeah i think renewable energy in this regards is becoming a more uh, spotlight uh, uh, from the a uh, lot of stakeholders in indonesia especially from the government and we have uh, we are hoping that we can roll the major significant changes in the regulation uh, to really push renewable energy to move forward even ourselves we have uh, uh, 551 projects uh, 1.9 gigawatt uh, which requires 4.9 billion us dollar now in the pipeline that we hope that we can work with the uh, overseas investor international support to bring all of this project online So that's why uh, becoming part of this Horasis community is really great experience for us to gain the support and hopefully uh, this we we can be part uh, to provide solutions uh, that can uh, be impactful uh, towards the recovery especially for the economy uh, in Indonesia cooperating with our international partners uh, including Japan and other countries including UK uh, and and also uh, uh, other uh, countries that uh, now we are working together uh, for a better Uh, uh, environment uh, in Indonesia. So that will be my first take on the discussion. I'm looking forward to discuss and, uh, and hear from all of you today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ivan. I appreciate that. Um, so next, uh, Nicholas Michelson, who is Chief Executive Officer of Matero. And Nicholas, you are now in the UK, or where are you talking to us from? Lisbon, I understand. I, 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 yes, I'm. I'm actually in Lisbon, but the the firm is uh, headquartered in London. Okay, wonderful. So, can you talk to us um, about? We had a little bit of a discussion offline about um, uh, investing and how you see investing in this new sector. How does this affect uh, your investors and your perspective? How does ESG affect what you do? Yeah, I think that the the way that we we look at it is it's not so much as it's uh, whether it's ESG or impact or responsible investing. We we like to look at it as um, as looking at outcomes at the systems level. Um, and when you when you take a a sort of a um, a far enough view back and look at what is actually happening, um, you start seeing that we need much more integrated financial products. Right. So right now it's very, very siloed. So you have credit on one silo, you have equity in another silo, you have private capital, public capital, etc. And there is a much, much higher need to 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 integrate all of those capital sources and and types of investors together because we need to look at what what happens at the at the system level. And just to put you know some sort of statistics on that, every time in the in the in, from a global perspective, every time. We we create ten dollars worth of value in the food system. It actually costs us twelve, and that is simply for the fact that uh, if you measure value simply in the food system alone, you don't capture the cost that it has in in health issues, in social issues, in environmental issues. So if we start actually attributing cost back to the where where it stems from, we are actually at a net deficit uh, pretty much across the board. Which is why it is so important that one we have better collaboration between different types of investors, and two that we take a coordinated view on what needs to happen. Because if we look at COVID, you know, it, you, one could say yes, that is a, a health challenge, but clearly, as we've all seen, it has major spillover effects into our economic systems, into our uh, our food systems, etc. So, so, so one of the things that I think is 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 key. In order to 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 build back uh, from COVID, in order to really um, get sustainability and regeneration implemented and operationalized, is to look at this as how do we make sure that we have a a resilient healthcare system, as many people have been talking about. How do we make sure that we have resilient social systems, etc. And that is just it's a different lens. It's it still revol- revolves around. Investing it still revolves around driving a, a competitive return, but it it is a different way of structuring it and sort of starting with the outcome in mind and then reverse engineering that. Um, and I think that that is that is a core element that has not really happened a lot, um, but it's something that we're seeing more and more. And I think that the whole notion of 
trying to think of ESG or impact or whatever it might be as a separate asset class is, right. is a misnomer because everything has an impact. It's just whether you manage it or not. And, um, and at the end of the day, it just comes down to is it good investing or not. Okay. So you're, I would say then you're an outcome-based investor. Yes, very, very much and, so. And I would imagine that that could lead to um, uh, new business um, sectors as well, new business opportunities, if you look at things that way. Okay, yes. wonderful. Thank you so much, Nicholas. So, ne so next we have Jonathan Tower, who is managing partner of Arcteris and Impact Investors. So definitely also on the on the arc of impact. Um, so innovation. One thing um, um, I find quite interesting is this idea that innovation is not just talking about silos um, in Silicon Valley, but actually innovation can take place. Uh, in many different areas of the United States, for example, or all over the world. And maybe we shouldn't be trying to mimic what happened in Silicon Valley and that there are other opportunities. So um, can you share us, uh, share your experience with us, Jonathan? Good morning. Hey. Good, good morning, Lyric. It's great to be with you here today. And thank, thank you again for, for hosting us. Um, this is a, this is really a timely topic for Arcteris and I think for, for the global community because, uh, what we've seen happen here is COVID has accelerated, of course, many bad things happening, but it's also accelerated some good things happening. Um, Arcteris has been in the impact investing space for 12 years now, we've launched six funds. We focus exclusively on underserved, under-resourced communities and underrepresented entrepreneurs. So what does this mean in practice? It means U.S. inner cities and very low-income rural areas, plus uh, diverse entrepreneurs who start companies and create the drivers of um, healthy living wage job creation in inner cities. Why this matters is is really the substance of recovery. Um, sure, the stock market has recovered in certain sectors. Uh, certain real estate markets have recovered. Jobs have recovered in certain sectors. And in others, they haven't. And those sectors, those parts of the country that have lagged in the recovery, they will continue to do so unless we can help them move forward. So the, the key elements to this are really jobs, healthy living communities, and also access to broadband data. Uh, and that's really what we invest in. On the job side, we invest in uh, operating businesses that'll create 100 to 1,000 new living wage jobs in an inner city or targeted rural area. Often this happens, it happens in a place that is lost its major employer or it's lost its major industry. Think Detroit and the gradual and then sharp decline of automotive jobs and recent resurgence. We invested in a lot of um, companies in Detroit that would be able to help replace the jobs that were coming out of automotive um, over the past decade. In rural Maine, the largest employer in a particular county was a ski mountain that shut down for six years. Um, reopening the ski mountain, bringing people back to work and helping to support uh, growth and regrowth in the community was key. Uh, Upper Peninsula, Michigan, it was a paper mill that shut down. In, in a mill town, you know, you, you've basically got one employer. And if that shuts down, there aren't too many options for the, uh, for the people other than looking at other places to move. And that breaks up our communities, which we don't want to have happen. So how can we intervene there? And there we invested in a, a paper mill that became a paper recycling mill and uh, was ultimately mm -hmm. um, helping to uh, process waste paper and uh, produce uh, craft paper. So people get back to work in those types of situations. So so how, how does this actually come together and, and what can mayors and governors and other policy leaders be doing today to help set forth the right conditions precedent to have that kind of recovery in your own communities? Because you, you know what it looks like when things are recovering quickly and everybody's back to work and masks start coming off and people feel okay again. But you know what if you're one of those communities that's gonna be slow? Well. A lot of the U.S. tax programs and incentive programs have involved either throwing money directly at the problem, which is 
I mean, direct is, is generally a good way of, of getting your accomplish, uh, of accomplishing your goals because, uh, eliminating middlemen is, is a, is a good way to get from point A to point B. The other is through tax reductions. And so Arcteris has launched, uh, opportunity zone funds, um, in recent years. And these make use of the opportunity zone tax incentive, which, give significant benefits on long-term capital gains tax. That's a big thing for what we do in the United States. But looking at it in a more global macro um, perspective, it, it really helps you get a deal done better by either de-risking or enhancing the returns of that investment. What I really want to shift our focus to is what is the, the highest risk portion of the capital stack that government and foundations can embrace to help accelerate some of these projects. It's not participating peri mm -hmm. It's the it's the bottom layer. When you when you think about it, um, you know, we, we do broadband fiber in opportunity zones in a lot of areas. It's one of our uh, themes. It's not all we do, but it's an important theme in, in our funds. We're we're investing in broadband fiber for inner cities or for very low income rural areas. And the the problem with this is not that you can't get enough money, it's that you can't get the risk capital. And the analogy there would be soft costs. For those of you who have built a building, it's getting the permits done and the legal and hiring the architects and all of these things where you're putting money into soft costs that if the project doesn't work out, you're not getting that capital back. That's that's gone. Uh, so that's really the riskiest um curve in the gestation period of any project, whether you're talking about real estate or broadband fiber or starting a company. And I think where, where government innovation and foundation innovation has really leapt forward as a result of COVID is looking at how, how do we use our capital to, to get in at that first stage there, which is, is not usually where government participates. That's, that's the, the realm of, you know, high risk venture capital investors. How do you involve government in there? And there, 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 there are really three, three pieces that I would talk about that I think are, are really useful here. And, uh, if, if, if these answer the question completely, I'll be surprised, but at best it'll spur some new questions and some new conversations that maybe we can have after today. Number one idea is starting in with guarantees, which are non-cash. You're, you're helping um, mayors and governors and other uh, policy leaders create programs without taking cash out of appropriations, but where the government has given a partial guarantee of reimbursement if a project fails. Uh, we'll do broadband fiber in Native American tribal lands that um, you know lack the, the population density or the income uh specs that would help pencil out a normal project. Government helps by providing a guarantee and says, okay, well, you're going to build a $100 million project here. You're going to have 5 million of soft costs. We will reimburse you for the soft costs if the project does not come to fruition or if the project does not return capital. That That's a very good way of doing it because the government is taking higher risk, but shelling out zero capital in those kinds of transactions. The second, and we see this more with foundations, but I think with some of the American Rescue Act and uh, the CARES Act and the Infra Act that have come out of US Congress recently, you'll see more of it on the government side, but th this is really le leading in on the front side by putting capital in. Uh, found when foundations do this, it's called a program-related investment. They're making an investment whose return of capital is junior and subordinate to those of the other investors. So the government is actually agreeing to take more risk than all the other people around the table. And uh, you know, we're a big proponents of this, this methodology and there's nothing specific about it. To, it has to come from this kind of legislation or this kind of foundation. It's just functionally money that is, is the junior in the capital stack. And then the third is um, highly targeted grants um, with uh, that could be a monetary grant, but uh, the cities are sitting on all sorts of real estate these days. And if you think about it, um, you know, name, name your city or your county, and they have a long list of properties that they own for one reason or another. Maybe it's long-term legacy. Maybe someone didn't pay their property taxes, but, but there are large parcels of property that are, are out there government can contribute that real estate or that property or even an existing building 
into a transaction as their capital contribution, very similar to the last money out capital concept that I just shared, and then allow private investment to come in on top to complete the project, expand the project. Um, the city of Boston uh, just uh, orchestrated this type of capital stack um, for some of its affordable housing, the largest affordable housing project in Boston. It had been there for decades. It needed to be triple the size. They contributed that project and then private capital comes in on top of it with opportunity zone money uh, to enhance, expand, renovate, pay for deferred maintenance and put up 11 new buildings. These are the types of exciting projects which really underlie public, private and philanthropic partnerships, which um, I think have much more use and clarity in our uh, post-COVID economy. Right. And I think working on the digital divide there, the one thing that COVID did was really underline, you know, with kids in parking lots trying to get Wi-Fi access so that they could participate in school. It really underlined um, the digital divide that we have you know, in the United States. So, I, um, John, was one of those kids. It wasn't just my kids, <laughs> but uh, right. yes, we all experienced our share of that. <laughs> so, you know, you've been talking about incentives, and that's something that Yvonne mentioned at the beginning. Can you talk to us, Yvonne, more a little bit more about the incentives that you've seen used in in the energy world? And in right. Asia in particular, would be very interested in hearing about that. Right. Well, there's always this uh, trilemma uh, on how we can make a balance between economy, energy, and also uh, regarding uh, the environment. Uh, and this is uh, what is actually uh, becoming uh, an issue for many years, uh, in, especially in Indonesia, because uh, we try to ramp up our economic growth uh, and we have to use the cheapest uh, source of energy as much as possible. Uh, and and we uh, somehow we chose coal as one of uh, our uh, more, uh, energy uh, that we can rely on to support the economy, but we cannot do that anymore. Uh, so that's why uh, we have to shift the, the incentives that trying to support this cheap uh, but, uh, but fossil energy to becoming clean energy. And that is... Uh, uh, kind of a, a shift in, in, in the mindset of the government right now. And it's not actually the easiest way to do. Uh, yeah, for instance, now actually we are providing about uh, 5 uh, billion US dollar for uh, LPG and also for the gasoline per year uh, in Indonesia. But how many billion US dollar actually already being given uh, for incentives uh, towards renewable energy? Uh, I think it's almost uh, uh, zero. Uh, uh, and 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 on on the contrary on the contrary we have to be more competitive than the fossil fuel we have to sell uh renewable energy uh, right now in at the price of 85% of the fossil fuel but then again uh, uh, the covid-19 is happening we are being oversupplied by fossil fuel and the international pressure is there uh, and uh, yeah, we, we hope that uh, yeah, we, we can really change the way we uh, try to establish our fiscal policy so that not the billion dollars goes to the fossil fuels, but the billion dollars actually able to go towards the renewable energy. And this is what we are trying to fight for at the moment uh, in the parliament and towards the executive order of the president and also uh, towards the Ministry of Finance uh, 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 decision. And uh, and thank and thankfully, now we have, uh, uh, hopefully we're going to have also something what we call as the uh, carbon uh, pricing uh, and carbon tax. And we hope that this can be out very soon. Uh, which can hope we hope that this can uh, 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 provide us more capital uh, that we can utilize to provide incentive uh, for the renewable energy producers and also for the renewable energy uh, uh, consumers. Uh, uh, and uh, that's why we need to ha hear. We need to have more voices uh, coming from uh, countries that uh, have successfully made this transition uh, from mm -hmm. the fossil fuels to the clean energy. And be and be part of this transition uh, uh, as, my, uh, if, uh, as much as 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 it is possible uh, uh, coming into developing countries like us. Because why we have the population, we have the economic growth, the attraction should be there. But we need to know how we can help bring those investments coming in, and we need more voices and more dialogues like this uh, to uh, all stakeholders. So we know that this is 
uh, the right way to do for us to establish the right incentives uh, to support the uh, the transition from the fossil fuel to the uh, renewable energy. So, Nicholas, how would you uh, how do your investors see incentives? You're talking about the, what you've described as is, is outcome based investing, but what are the in, incentives that you are seeing that are successful now, or what would you like to see as new incentives? Yeah, I, I think I think that there's a very important uh, point here is that I I personally don't believe that a lot of this transition will really happen from sticks, right? There 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 is that needs to be that element too, but the main driver will be from carrots, right? And and so I think Jonathan mentioned something very interesting about how do you create these these blended finance structures where you can have like first loss mechanisms. Something that incentivizes more uh, inflow of, of of private capital, and I think that if you think of a lot of the corporate scope three uh, emissions that are happening now, which every you know every multinational in the world right now is sitting pondering on how can they actually transition that? It's a, it's an incredibly hard problem. Um, instead of looking at it as a thing that needs to be squashed by just reporting better, which is an important part of it. There needs to be more of a focus on how do you create incentive structures to convert your suppliers, right? So if you're a large multinational, your purchasing power is something that is collateralizable in the sense that that can actually be used to to create uh, attractive financing options for your suppliers for them to go through that transition to become more sustainable to, you know, whether that's regenerative agriculture, whatever it might be, right? So I think that there's a need for more financial mechanisms that can actually incentivize not just on on a, on a sort of um, uh, of a macro level, but also really really down into the individual level of someone that needs to refinance their loans, uh, someone that that needs to purchase new equipment, uh, implement new technology, whatever it might be. I think that that is that is a core core element, and this notion of um, using these first loss mechanisms makes that really, really interesting because you can get to a, um, a weighted uh, scenario where the the loans that are provided to, for instance, uh, because this is an area that we've been looking into a lot, uh, farmers that are looking to to transition to regenerative agriculture, right? You need to fund that J curve of the three years, three to five years that it takes for them to convert their 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 farms, right? And that needs to come from somewhere, but you can actually get to a point where they get really, really attractive financing terms that they would never be able to go to a bank to get. And, and so those, those, those way of, of, of blending the capital stack that, that Jonathan uh, mentioned a lot about, I think is absolutely crucial in, in, in a lot of these, uh, these, these areas. Well, and Nicholas, um, as you know, we've been living in an era of unprecedented fiscal stimulus. And so governments have had money to do things that they haven't had before. But um, if, and now we're seeing signs of inflation, and there is a lot of talk, especially in the United States, of, you can tell I live in Chicago, sorry, in the background. <laughs> so there are lots of um, uh, discussions of increasing taxation. Um, and so is this something, increased inflation, increased taxation, some kind of um, slowdown in the fiscal, uh, in fiscal stimulus. Is this something that concerns you? Um, not today, but next year. Yeah, I mean, of, of course, of course, that has tremendous uh, effects on on everything, and especially when you're looking into to private markets, right? That that will right. just have uh, a big impact. But I also see that on on the flip side, where you know, if if there are more of a carbon tax that comes into play. If if you if you can balance the carrot and the stick, uh, right. I think that, that is that is what what we need to 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 kind of to get to because just uh, just investing in new technology alone won't do the trick, right? We can we can run around and play if you're familiar with, familiar with that game whack a mole where you you, right. you you chop on on one mole and then five others pop up and that's kind of the same thing that we keep doing over and over again where we focus our way into something in an area. And then we don't see sort of all of the other things that are popping up, right? So, so it's it's not that it's either or; it's both and. That's that's uh, the way that I tend to look at it. 
Okay, great. And Jonathan, what do you see as your greatest um, obstacle? Um, we've been talking about opportunities, incentives, and I kind of segued into maybe some issues that could cause us, um, uh, slowdowns in in uh, everybody's objectives. But what is the biggest obstacle that you face in terms of the goals you have? Well, an obstacle that we we experience uh, weekly and sometimes daily is is just shifting this mindset to what I think is a new modality of, um, of, of cooperation between government and for-profit enterprise. Uh, there, there's something um, anathematic about companies taking money out of their profits to do something that is fundamentally good for communities, but runs counter to shareholder incentives. And, and obviously we're, we're trying to change that, 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 uh, that lean. Um, in in government, there's a general um, reluctance to put government resources into something that might result in profits for shareholders in a company. And and mm-hmm. how, how do you how do you match these two concepts together? Um, you know, one one framework I'd, I'd suggest for the government side is to to say, look, if if we're if we're providing a guarantee or we're providing true subsidy capital to make something good for your project happen. Uh, we're, we're paying for something. Then we, we want a community benefits agreement. You're, you're getting all this government money to build something. The thought that you might turn into a billionaire is, is frightening to us and to our taxpayers because you did it with government money. Uh, but in exchange for giving you that opportunity, we want a community benefits agreement that will ensure that you provide affordable broadband access for the next 25 years. Okay. Uh, that you'll have a ceiling based on you know, inflation or local income levels. Um, you, you will use this government money to not only create something that's good, but continue to do, do good in the years ahead. Um, I think on the on the company side, it it may be easier sometimes because um, you know people understand incentives and, and companies understand. Hey, if I invest in a marketing plan, it will help me here. Um, what we've really tried to demonstrate is um, that that impact oriented companies, on a whole, they might or might not be more successful than the average or the norm. But I think what's fair to say is that impact oriented companies that are successful in actually delivering positive community benefit and then not bragging, but telling about it, um, saying, hey, you know, we, you know, we're, we're, we're a company in Detroit. We created 150 jobs for low income workers and they're all earning a living wage today. That should be part of your marketing strategy. You're not doing it for marketing purposes. You're doing it because it's the right thing to do. But if that can help your marketing strategy, if that can help you attract and retain new customers, if that can help you um, develop a more loyal employee base who feel you know there's a dual mission and their purpose. I'm not just making widgets. I'm actually helping to rebuild a city and, and rebuild communities. Um, I, I think that community companies that are, are able to um, explain that and provide a, an articulate narrative in the way that government has always done is is uh, it's the uphill battle, but it's the right path forward. And and we're we're trying to help companies think about how to articulate that. Wonderful. Okay. And and same question for you, um, Yvonne. What are your biggest um, obstacles? Right. I think the biggest obstacle, uh, well, especially with the business, uh, the main business that we're doing, uh, which is renewable energy in Indonesia, is uh, how we can convince the government that climate change, in fact, uh, is really affecting the core foundations of our economy in the sense that uh, our agricultural sector is being affected, our fishery sector is being affected. And if we're not doing something to make our core uh, livelihood uh, uh, that's already being impacted by this climate change if we are not doing something about it, then actually we are losing our competence uh, in terms of our 
uh, uh, how we can make sure that we are able to be resilient in terms of providing uh, the necessary uh, supply of food uh, uh, for our population. And, and we are ended up uh, importing of something that we can actually produce in Indonesia. And, and, and now we are already in the point of no return. If we don't have the right uh, uh, ecosystem of business uh, that really able to thrive uh, the players in the sustainability sector uh, to get what we need uh, and what already enjoyed by the fossil fuel players for so many years, then uh, we are afraid that uh, we are not going into the right uh, tra trajectory. And I can see that the government is trying to do this and that, and they're trying to do various kind of approach. So I, I hope that the focus will be there, that the energy transition is the way to go, we need to put the right incentives in place. Uh, the investors are already waiting, billions of dollars already waiting in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in all of those financial uh, hub in, in, uh, nearby us. And we just need to bring those uh, money in. But uh, then again, uh, uh, if we only stuck with the gimmick that, okay, we want to achieve this target of renewable energy in 2023%, 2025. But if we don't have the core understanding of why we need to do so, then uh, we're not going to be there because in fact that now we're like what 11 gigawatts but our um, uh, what our aim in 2025 is 45 gigawatts so there's so many gigawatts that we need to uh, you know uh, that we need to achieve in these remaining uh, years that we don't have much left so there's the big challenge there and hopefully we can do the right things in the remaining time that we have Okay, thank you so much. So we've just been joined by uh, Payal Dalau from MasterCard. Uh, she's Senior Vice President, Social Impact of International Markets um, at the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth. And um, you're joining us from London, is that right? I am, and many apologies for the technical difficulties. I'm in a studio in London, and you would think it would be uh, stable, but not so much. So um, I'm sorry to have missed a wonderful conversation, and thank you, Lyric, for your graceful moderation uh, with the technical oh. difficulties. <laughs> oh, that's how it goes. That's the, it's, it's never easy. Um, but, you know, I wonder if you could share with us some of your experience. Um, uh, we we um, had a little bit of a uh, chance to talk about impact-led investing um, uh, previously. Um, would love to hear your... Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. So what I would say is... So I'm part of the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, which is what Lyric just mentioned. We are the philanthropic hub and the social impact arm of MasterCard, the company. And, you know, I would say that the, the pandemic has exacerbated all of the inequalities that we have seen and has really brought to light what we need to work on as an impact sector. Um, if I think about what's happening in the world, I really think about it. Um, kind of across three frames. First is we've seen income inequality really, really grow. We already knew that was a problem, but the, the pandemic has really exacerbated that and accelerated that. Second, information inequality has become increasingly an issue. People don't have the same levels of information and access to data. And third, what we see really be an issue during the pandemic is around digital inequality. So those who had access to broadband and internet and knew how to navigate those tools were able to manage lockdowns, were able to take their shops, their brick and mortar shops to e-shops. They were able to, to manage and adapt, but those who weren't were just further left behind. And so what I think the pandemic shows us in those in social impact is the scale and the magnitude of the challenges before, before us and the need of what we do now and how that needs to change. So I think, especially speaking from kind of a private sector-led um, social impact arm, you know, we were very focused on how we at MasterCard can help drive it. And we certainly are still there. Mm -hmm. But now it's how can we do it together so that we're not constantly replicating and duplicating everyone's efforts, but rather we're being complementary, we're being additive. Because I think the scale of the problem is something we I certainly haven't seen in my lifetime. And so the, the normal ways of driving social impact, the normal ways that funders and donors work with grantees and implementing partners, all of that needs to change. And what that I think really, really forces us to do is think about how we think about innovative partnerships going forward and how we do philanthropy differently. So it's a whole different world is what you're saying. And we have to, we need a new <laughs> set of operating instructions. 
and the, the challenges are immense. They really are. I agree with that. So um, what I'd like to kind of end with is asking each of you the critical message that you would like to get across to everybody in our audience today. Uh, and uh, Nicholas, I think I'll start with you since it's, I think, about your turn now. What is it that you wish that everybody knew that you know and uh, really understood well in order for all of us to move forward together? Um, I think that it is the, the fact that none of the challenges we're seeing in the world exist in silos, right? That everything mm -hmm. is interconnected and there is a like massive need to look at this in an interconnected, interconnected systemic way. So the, 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 the Climate change, social inequality, all of those things are symptoms of deeper underlying root causes. And in order to get to those root causes, we need to take a fundamentally different way of looking at how we invest and how we solve that. So I would say if there's one thing I could I could leave anyone with from this is look like let's let's get better at looking at the systemic solutions to the systemic problems. Okay, and maybe this sort of meeting is a way to start that and the conversation in order to achieve that. And uh, Jonathan, you too, what is the one message you'd like to leave with everybody today? So I'm giving everybody a minute to, <laughs> to be impactful. Oh, we can't hear you, Jonathan. You're muted. Thank okay. you. Thank you. There now. I, I thought Nicholas' comment was great, and I was just still kind of absorbing that. Um, I, th I think my I, I, I that was a great comment, Nicholas. The um, what the, the message that I want to project here is that um, you know people who work in business or in the investment industry uh, who are good at what they do. You know, we we possess a unique set of skills that um, are really good if you're managing a mutual fund and trying to beat up an index or you're an investment banker and you can put together a deal or you're a trader or a structurer or a portfolio manager, or an analyst, people who work in investments have a unique set of skills. And, and what I would say is that, um, you know, 20 years ago, I think the, the people from that line of business who said, I want to give back, you know, what they did was they wrote a check and they endowed a room at the Met right. or they, uh, you know, created a college or a scholarship program. They, they wrote checks um, and some of them um, said, hey, I'm going to go one step further. I'm going to go run a foundation. I'm going to run a nonprofit. I'm going to do, do something. And I, I'd say the people who wrote checks, great, keep doing that. The people who went and ran, ran foundations, Maybe, maybe not. As a, as a career coach, I'd kind of say, what made you good as an investment banker will make you awful running a foundation. Your <laughs> elbows are too smart, impatient, um, nonprofit, people on nonprofit boards never make a point. Um, you know, you, you will get frustrated. And I, I'd say, you know, think about what you can do as an investor to get back into the community and say, okay, I'm going to start an investment program whose outcome and whose goals are focused on community improvement right. as opposed to making another IPO technology company or, um, you know, getting another deal done or making a logbook happen. And These are the kinds of things that we're really trying to project today. And Yvonne, same question for you, your message for everybody today. I think I really resonate echoing uh, what uh, Nicholas and uh, Jonathan said. And uh, I just would like to add that I think another uh, another thing that is quite important in these difficult times is how we can provide the easiness of access of, for everyone to get the support that they need in the most effective way uh, as possible. And this is uh, also uh, trying to talk about uh, uh, what, I, I what I mentioned before this, which is how we can help the government to make the transition, how we can help the SMEs to get the access to financing that they need so that they can uh, sustain and, uh, and also maybe transitioning from uh, what they have been relying uh, before for offline to becoming online and, and how we can really join efforts, not working in silos, uh, working together, easing the access uh, to one another so that we can make this transition uh, together and uh, we can able to become a more thriving economy, hopefully uh, after the pandemic that all of us hope that is going to be over very soon. So, so that will be my... 
finish Thank it. you. And Paya, last word to you. <laughs> last word. There's not much to add, except I would say we not only need to focus on the individual level of impact, like the micro business or the worker, we also need to focus on the ecosystem. And so let's not forget the organizations that support the workers and the entrepreneurs. Let's not, let's not forget the NGOs and the charities because they are also dealing with massive uh, disruption because of the pandemic. We need a very functioning civil society. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, I think we've just run out of time, but thank you so much. And Frank, thank you for putting us all together. This is a terrific panel. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Bye. everyone. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Bye.